All right, I think we've waited long enough. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Think Different, an instructional seminar on how to code smarter, not harder. I know all of you are hard workers, but maybe it's time to slow down a bit and think around things so you don't have to work so hard for all of your projects. We are Clemson ACM. My name is Austin. I'm the president of Clemson ACM. Right over here is Robert. We are on Steam for our more casual stuff, and we are on a free node channel. Sometimes, we usually idle. So come and join us if you feel like trolling us. Hello. Hello. All right. So coming up during this presentation, we're sort of going to be building a very, very simple project over the course of the next hour or so, and demonstrating some approaches and tactics to make the development process easy, not necessarily just the coding part, because if we were telling you how to code easier, we'd be doing another presentation on Vim. But we're talking about making things less painful for you, taking the stuff that you have to do all of the time and somehow rearranging it or making it automatic so you don't have to worry about it anymore. We're going to start out with how to start out with your project and make it strong so that you don't make so many mistakes later on. We're going to teach you a little bit about how to automate away some of the annoying parts of things that you have to do over and over again. We're going to tell you a little bit about what to do when things go bad, when terrible things happen and you wish they didn't, but they do anyway. And finally, we're going to talk about how to smartly finish things up. So, Robert, why don't you start talking about starting out strong? So, starting out strong, first thing you want to do is thank some happy thoughts. but. Specifically what that means is think about what you're doing before you code. Carpenters have this kind of analogy, measure twice, cut once. So before you go and spend a lot of effort trying to implement a solution that won't ultimately work, try to give it some thought and figure out exactly what exactly you need to do. If you have a whiteboard or know where to find one, there's some in the library, in McAdams Labs, sometimes it helps to plan out your project a little bit on a whiteboard or on a sheet of paper. But the important thing is that you get an idea of what is involved with the project. And then once you have that idea, then you try to budget your time. The goal is to do a little bit of work regularly and then track the amount of work that you're doing against your predictions so you can figure out whether or not you're behind on your project. Um, the, the alternative is, of course, doing everything within about three days from the day from when the project is due. And that, no one likes that. It hurts. I know I've done it. It wasn't a good idea. I keep telling myself I'm never going to do this again, but then I do. It took me like three years to stop doing that. So be better than me and start early. So the next thing that we're going to highly advise that you do is consider version control. Version control is a wonderful tool for a lot of different reasons. So I recommend that you check out our Git seminar for those who weren't able to make it here last week. We will have we have the recordings from the past two years online already, but we also will have the recording from last week up as well. This will give you an idea of what exactly is version control. We're going to be demonstrating a little bit of it today, but we're kind of going to be glossing over most of how the mechanics of the version control system work in order to facilitate working on the project. So you may be wondering at this point, what project are we doing? You've probably heard of it. It's kind of infamous within the computer science community. We're going to be coding FizzBuzz today. Um, now what we're going to be doing is probably, definitely, is overkill for FizzBuzz. But that said, the ideas that we're going to apply today to FizzBuzz will definitely still be useful to other projects, such as some of the ones made by Dr. Dean or Dr. Feaster or some of the other professors you may have. Let me see some hands. Who doesn't know what FizzBuzz is? Wow, a lot of you. All right, let me quickly explain what FizzBuzz is. It sounds kind of trippy, but actually it's really simple. You make a loop from about the numbers 1 to 100, and if the number you're looking at is divisible by 3, print Fizz. If it's divisible by 5, print Buzz. If it's divisible by both, print FizzBuzz. Otherwise, don't print anything. That's it. Surprisingly enough, there are some people who can't do that. So the project that we're going to be coding exactly today is slightly different. So we're going to take a command line argument and then print Fizz if it's divisible by 2, Buzz if it's divisible by 3. But the idea still kind of holds. Basically, you're testing, two different, you're testing a number for divisibility by two numbers and then printing a string as a result. Um, now, just to kind of recap why you'd want to use version control is it allows you to track 
your development history in progress and make that history searchable. So for example, you're working through a project and you want to know why you didn't take a particular course of action or why a particular line of code is there. Because you wrote good commit messages working on your project all along, you can see why a particular change was introduced and when it was introduced. And if you, you can also do things such as reset my current state to about yesterday and start over from there. If you realize that you've been wasting your time. Um, some tools for doing this are Git and Mercurial. Um, but as I said, check out our version control seminar if you want to know more. So the other thing that we want to introduce today is what's called test-driven development. So if you've been in CPSC 215 or CPSC 372, you may have heard the concept of test-driven development and may have written some tests in the Java unit test framework, JUnit. Um, but we're, today we're going to be introducing some more tools that will allow you to do this and talking about really why it's important in case it didn't really set home when you were doing it in 215 or 372. We're the actually going to be using a pretty cool one called BATS. It's very simple to get started up with and is a nice way to just give your code some input and make sure that what you get is the correct answer. Yeah, so the basics of test-driven development are write your tests first, make sure your tests fail, code your tests, or write code until you pass the tests, and then make commits as you pass additional tests along the way. Once you pass all the tests, your project is done. It's nice. Yeah, so it gives you a good measurement of when you have finished a project. So for example, if you're writing your tests, you might, for example, include the standard input that's provided by your professor. You might include, say, the boundary cases. So basically, if you accept numbers from one to a million, include zero and a million in your test. You may also check, depending on what class you're in, you may test a couple invalid inputs to make sure that you handle them gracefully and you don't just completely blow up or fail. Now, Robert, when are we going to start coding this example project? Probably right about now. Okay, cool. So. Let's get started. So first things first is we're going to go ahead and create our source code repository. Now, once again, I want to emphasize you guys do not have to follow along with this on your terminals. We have sort of a pre-baked solution up at this link. It's on a GitHub page. So you can take a look at it uh, right now. Kind of follow along with what the completed version is going to look like. Or you can just follow along with what Robert's doing and watch what's going on. So right now we have this file called test.bats. So just to kind of give you an overview of what the content of this file is, is we have what's called a um, doc line at the top. Can anybody not see or read my terminal? OK, cool. So at the top, you'll see user bin m bats. So that says we're going to be using the bat shell, bats shell for this. And then we have, following that, a series of test cases. So just to kind of give you an idea of what this says, so we're going to run test case one. So we've given a name to our test. And for that test, we're going to run fizzbuzz with the argument one. Now, the run command in bats is kind of a wrapper around a function. And what that function does for you is it go ahead, goes ahead and assigns some convenience variables namely status and output, so that you can perform some checks on that output when you've finished your test. So as you would see here, when we run the program fizzbuzz against the number one, we expect to see the output being zero. In other words, it ran successfully. And we'd expect the output of that command to be the empty string. Now that the status, the output thing that um, Robert just mentioned, for, uh, the status for a program that you have run in bash is if, for example, you're working on a C project that's returning a certain number from the main loop. So normally when you add something like return zero, that will be that status number. Or if you say return one, the status would be one. Yeah. So we can see that any number that's divisible by two, we expect buzz to be in the output and to be the only output. And then on one's divisible by three, we expect to see fizz. But on 6, which is divisible by both 2 and 3, we expect to see the output fizz buzz. Um, I've also included here two invalid test cases. So we're going to test for a word, something that's not parsable as an integer, as well as the case where we pass no arguments, in which case we want to throw an error condition. If so I suppose our modified fizz buzz is actually uh, divisible by 2 for fizz and 3 for buzz rather than 5, right? Yes. Okay. So slightly different than maybe the traditional problem, but the idea is still basically the same. So now that we've written our tests, uh, 
we'll go ahead and create a file called fizzbuzz.c. We'll put a main oops, loop with a int argc and a char star star argv. And then we'll just have it return zero for right now. And that's all we're going to put in for right now. We're done. Sorry. So now if we compile that into fizzbuzz.out, like so, and then we run bats on test.bats. Um, this is a program we have installed. So it's just basically, I think it's like a 300 line bash script. You can copy it into your bin directory on a Linux machine and then it will run as I'm getting ready to demonstrate right now. If you're on a Linux, if you're not on a machine where you have administrative rights to install bats, you can just copy it into your local directory, the bats program, and then just do dot slash instead of bats. So if we run this right now, we'll see that all of, almost all of our test cases failed. But two of them are good, awesome. Yeah, and let's think about why those would be good. So. When we ran this program, we expected to see no output from the number one and from the number five. So we got no output, so we got what we expected. So right now, we're going to go ahead and call that OK. Some other tools that you can use for doing this is if you use Python, there's a module in Python called unit test, which does basically the same thing. If you've ever used um, Java, there's a, per, there's a module called JUnit, basically the same idea. So any questions about what we've done so far with test-driven development and writing our tests? Or about bats in general. Okay, cool. One neat thing that we sort of, I, I mean to emphasize about writing unit tests is that once you have written a full set of unit tests, you know that once they all pass, you are done with the project, which is a really nice, satisfying feeling rather than going and thinking, oh, did this work? Does this still work? Does this still work? Running all these things manually, it's a hassle. Anyway, speaking of not doing things manually anymore, let's talk a little bit about automation. Now, you may have noticed that Robert had to type in GCC some, some, some to, cre to create the executable that he ran. I'm sure all of you have had to do that before as well. That takes a lot of time. It's annoying. You can type up a bunch of times and get the command you had before, but that's still annoying. There must be a better way, and it turns out there is. There is a thing called make files, which we will be talking about extensively within this automation section. Make files are an ex exceedingly uh, convenient way to create a sort of thing that you want to do repeatedly, and then make it easy to do, or make it easy to type with one command. For example, this, make, this example make file on the board is uh, uh, is automating the compilation and running of a program called project.c. What you can do with this is at the end of creating this make file, in the same directory as that make file, type make run, and it will both compile the project that you're working on and run it with a predefined set of arguments so that you, don't, you only have to type make run to do all that stuff you normally would have to type for GCC and run it manually. There are you can very easily make a very complex but powerful make file. These two make files do the exact same thing, but this one is more extensible and somewhat more powerful. So we're going to take a look at what it takes to automate just a regular build for a project. Basically what's going to happen is you're going to create what's called a target for the project, the file you're going to be making or the executable that you want to make. The ta a task you want to run, make files are very complex. Um, so this, this example right here, this up here, uh, this phony rule is a special thing that let's make the program that we're going to be running know that this rule, to all run and clean, they don't actually represent a file that needs to exist later. Normally, make will redo things depending on a file that has been updated. But when you use this phony thing, don't worry, you don't have to remember this, it takes me a while to, um, it means that it won't check to see the timestamp of this different stuff. Now, um, 
In this specific example, you might notice that we don't we don't see GCC. That is because it's an implicit rule, which I think Robert knows a little bit more about. Yeah. Can you mention that? So basically, the idea is there are certain types of projects that GCC that Make knows how to build, and it creates what are called implicit rules. So the implicit rule for a anything that depends on a C file, so let's say it's a .o file, depends on a .c file, is by default $cc $c flags, and I then- I can barely read that, Robert. So, sorry if you can't exactly read this. Um, it's also not super important that you know exactly what these are, um, but dollar caret, dollar at sign. So basically what this says is, with the default C compiler, and the default arguments for the default C compiler, compile the entire list of things that are currently being compiled, and name them what the target is. So because we have defined previously the CC variable to be GCC, and we've defined our C flags variable to be, say, dash G dash wall, it will automatically generate this rule anytime it sees something that depends only on C files. So this is kind of a continuation of what we've done earlier. So any questions on kind of implicit make rules? The basics of make are that make is complicated, but you can make something that works pretty well that is very simple as well. Um, there are a bazillion make tutorials out there if you're still confused, and I highly recommend you go take a look to just work on making something that makes it so you can just type make and have your project compile and run. Now we're going to move on from that and go back. We still haven't talked about quite all of that. Now, everyone's used GCC at some point, right? Right. How many of you have heard of Clang? Let me see some hands. All right, so for those of you who have not heard of Clang before, Clang is another G, uh, C compiler, like GCC is. And there's a good side and a bad side to Clang. The good side is that you know how GCC, when you have an error or a syntax problem or something, it doesn't make any sense? Clang fixes that. The error messages when you compile something are superb. They're very easy to read, and they will point out where the problem it has found is. The only problem with Clang is that it is so good that sometimes it actually compiles things better than GCC does. And if your professor is testing with GCC, your project might not work if it does with Clang. So what a lot of us do here in the School of Computing is test with Clang and then, or develop with Clang and test with GCC as well. It's very easy to do with a make file. So that way you get the best of both worlds. Um, I highly recommend making it so that you're, you know your stuff will work on a lab computer. And we'll sort of talk about an easy way to make that happen a little bit later. Now, another quick thing is you will commonly see a target in a make file called all and one called clean. All and clean are just typical names for all, make everything in the project. And clean, get rid of everything, start fresh. That's basically what they do. All right, so let's step ahead, wrong way, there we go, and talk about automation of testing. Now, testing is actually pretty easy to automate if you're already following test-driven development, but sometimes you'll need to work with some other tools in addition to what you're using, um, or if you're not using something like BATS. Basically, all you'll need to do is create a test target in your make file so that you can type make test and it will run all of your tests so you can see whether or not those tests are actually working. Um, certain things you can test are stuff like the output of your function or the output of your file. For stuff like that, you can use complex tools like awk. We won't really be covering that too much. Uh, awk, just testing the output with bash and bats like we did before. You can use the diff tool, which will compare a uh, certain output with output that you would store in a pre-created file or grep to look for certain things you know you want to see. You can also test against exit status, which is that return from main thing I mentioned earlier that you can just use uh, with bash. Bash has a special variable called dollar sign question mark, which will just, um, which has the value of the last program that you ran's out return value. 
So if in that previous example we had that we had bats, it checked that uh, output. It had that output variable or the return status variable. It was status, right? Mm -hmm. That checked that for us. But if we're not using bats, then you can just type echo dollar sign question mark, and you can get the uh, return value of the program you just ran. Finally, we've all fought against memory leaks before. And for that, you can just run your program uh, through Valgrind. Who's heard of Valgrind or used it before? Oh, that's sad. They are not teaching the good stuff these days. All right, Valgrind is an absolutely awesome tool that will look for memory leaks and count how many you have, and it can do a bunch more stuff than that. It's really useful, and basically all you have to do is run your program through Valgrind. We will we'll do some demonstration about using Valgrind while we're doing the uh, examples of, oh well, extending this project that we've been working on. All right, so let's talk about document automation of some other stuff. Uh, you might run into a situation where a professor wants you to create documentation or create a log or do some other kind of random thing that you don't want to have to do manually. Generally speaking, you can spend some time. I'm not sure if that amount of time that you spend will actually save you time in the end, but it will still be cool. You can automate most of that stuff. For example, if you're working on a project that needs documentation, you can just make a docs target write documentation as you're developing your code, and then run that stuff through an automated documentation generator like Doxygen, Javadocs, or Sphinx. You probably won't run into anything like that in most of your undergraduate classes. If you're doing something like creating a log file, then you can use Python or, some, or a bash script to pipe uh, some, some predefined input into an interpreter, get that output, and then compile it all in one log file. Uh, Python and Bash are extremely powerful, and if you haven't looked into them at all before, it's well worth your while to learn about how to do kind of random system stuff that you would normally have to do all by yourself. Now, perhaps one of the most time-consuming portions and maybe most stressful portions of submitting, working on any project, is that point at about 11.59 where you're trying to submit the project just in time. I've done that before. It's happened. Now, if there was a way to automate that, then it would save you a lot of time, effort, and stress. And it turns out, in many cases, there actually is a way to automate that. Our most of, let me see you some hands. How many of you have a class that uses the hand-in system where you have to go online? And, all right, cool. So, we mentioned Mercurial earlier. The hand-in system is actually based on Mercurial. So you can treat a hand-in repository or something you're submitting to as a Mercurial repository. But in case you don't want to learn Mercurial, I made a really cool make file that is open to the public that automatically can submit your project. It will package and submit everything up to hand it for you. We'll demonstrate how to use that a little while later. You can also do some other cool stuff that we'll explain. It's definitely worth your while to check out, I think. So with that said, let's take a look at how we're going to do some of these things. Some of this automation stuff. So first we're going to copy the make file from now Robert is copying the make file from another place he's already downloaded it from. Mine is hosted on GitHub, so you can clone it into a repository and then copy it somewhere else. Um, you can also just have it locally and copy it to whatever project you're working on. Or you can download it and or copy it straight out of the GitHub page. We'll send out some links later. So, as you see here... Um, it looks scary, it's not. Yeah, so we're going to walk through kind of what information is here right now and then we'll kind of go on step by step. So you know how I talked about earlier with those implicit make rules? We set our C compiler to be Clang, and we want it to use the C++11 standard, so we said standard C++11. Then we set our C flags to be dash G, dash wall. That means include debugging symbols and produce additional warning information. This next line sets the shell that make will use to execute all of these commands. By default, it defaults to what's called the born shell, which is a legacy implementation of a shell. Um, it's still used on BSD and some other operating systems, but there are enough things that are different from it that it's important that you make sure that you test everything with bash since that's what you're going to be doing most of your building in normally. Basically speaking, uh, updating the shell variable means that you can do a bunch of cool stuff later on in the make file. Yeah. 
So if you had a repository URL for a Handin project, you could then paste that URL right here. But we kind of do have one. We're going to fake it with Buffet, right? Yes, eventually. Okay. Eventually? Yes. Nice. Um, so if you have that set up, then you can use the repo URL variable and go ahead and set that up. My for GitHub repo has a series of instructions for filling this stuff out, so you don't have to remember any of this. So we give the project a name. We can give the archive a name, like so. So by default, we want to use archive dash our archive our archiving command. So basically, what we're going to be used to put it, all of these files in one place is tar dash czf. If you need it as a zip file, you would replace this line with zip. So. Basically the same idea, but if you need to change your compression algorithm, this is where you do that. Um, there's a variable called local handin, which is where the local copy of the Mercurial repository will be stored. Um, don't change this unless you know what you're doing. Um, handin files. So handin files by default includes the make file, but we probably want to include fizzbuzz.c. In our if information. you have one, you want to include a readme and other unnecessary files that you want to have submitted. Yeah. So you'd include fizzbuzz.c there. You would include your information about what machines you want to test on. Now this is some, we're starting to get into some magical stuff. These are important because my magical make file, in addition to being able to submit to Mercurial automat or Handin automatically, there, it has a rule so that you can automatically connect to one of these lab machines in any one of the computer science labs, download your project from Handin, run all your tests, and then it'll give you the output of that stuff that you just ran on your local machine. So you can just test on the lab machines whatever you've been working on without actually having to be here with one command. Yes. It's super. We'll show you how it works. Sorry. So we won't be showing you how to do this because Austin has some key-based authentication oh, stuff, right. which You're is right. slightly different than mine. Um, so we actually won't, I guess. It's pretty easy, though. Yeah. So if you set up a passwordless SSH key, you can have that set up and automatically work. Um, so by default, the default target, basically, this is the target. This is the thing that make will run if you don't pass any other arguments. By default, in Austin's make file, it's all, which is basically just compile the source. While I'm testing, I find it's easier to change this to the word test. It means go ahead and run my local tests and compilation whenever I build the project. So we're going to skip the remote and handout lines. These essentially are magic, and you never need to modify them. Things you may need to change, though, would be the dot phony list, the clean. So in this case, to add a clean rule for this, we could say our tab rm this buzz lab test we're going to skip over for right now but this is what you would set up in order to do the tests on Austin's remote system so then all depends on fizzbuzz so fizzbuzz is an implicit rule and you see that fizzbuzz depends on fizzbuzz.c you will also see that there's a test rule in which we say bats um, tests.bats. Uh, the reason why I passed the dash t flag here is I wanted some additional out I wanted a different format of output which is a little bit easier to extract some build information from but that's basically the idea. So we're gonna write that file and then we're gonna type make. You'll see that it's now compiled my program and ran my tests. We still see that we have a bunch of errors in the tests. You'll see that BATS will tell you which lines exactly failed and why they failed. So any questions on what we see here? So this the nice thing about this is once you've made some edits to your original program file, all you have to do is type make. You, it automatically compiles, and you can see that your tests are failing or passing or something. You don't have to type in any other commands. So at this point, we're going to add the make file and the test file to our repository and do a commit. So are we going to demonstrate the uh, submission stuff? We will. Later? Once we have a little bit more work. Once we have a little bit more. Okay. But Robert, then we can't demonstrate how great it is to submit early and submit often. Okay. 
So, here is how one could, for example, set up a hand in repository. So, at Clemson, there is something known as the buffet servers. So these are basically version control systems that you can deploy on the fly. They're free to you. They're completely private. They're controlled by Clemson creden access credentials, so you don't have to worry about random people getting access to them. This is kind of cool because if you're using a buffet server to back up your, or a buffet repo to back up the code you're working on, in case anything bad happens to the stuff you have locally, you can get it back. Yeah. So we can create a new repository, give it a name, in this case will be fizzbuzz acm. We're going to say that it's a mercurial repository. It is not public and we'll call it AC give a description of acm makes fizzbuzz. Anyway. For the intents and purposes of this demonstration, this is a hand in repository. Yeah, this is basically what your professors would do on the back end. This is just the part you don't see. So now that we've created this, you'll see that we now have a URL that we can include. But there's one other thing that we're going to want to do. So if we edit our makefile, and we go back up to that assignment repo URL, and we paste that URL in, that's all nice and good. But if all you've done at this point is this, there's probably one thing that you haven't done yet. And that is you need to set up passwordless SSH access to the repository. So how does one do that, you ask? Well, you can go into settings, and you can add a key. So to create a key, you're going to use the SSH keygen command. Now, I've already done this, so I'm just going to copy my current public key onto this terminal. Again, there are tutorials about all this um, in many places and linked on the Magic Bank file repository. So no worries if you are a little bit um, confused or don't want to follow along right now. Then we could save that key. So now that we see that new key has been added, we should be able to do a make hand in. All right, we just submitted our project in about how many seconds was that? Maybe five? Three. Three? I'd say. Yeah, okay, cool. So normally when you have to manually zip and upload your project to your hand in um, page, that automates that. You can do it however many times you want in a minute or so before it's due. It makes you feel really cool when you can submit it about five times and do the exact same thing. So gone are the days when you submitted about 30 seconds too late because you ran into a problem using tar. So now if we go to the Robert U. Fizzbuzz ACM, we'll see that we now have a commit where we submitted a new project version. If you were to log on to Handin, you would see pretty much exactly the same thing. So any questions about what we've demonstrated so far? Okay. Seeing none, All right, cool. back to the presentation. Now, one more thing to mention about the SSH stuff Robert just did. Uh, and and another, another important aspect of working with SSH keys like he did is that you can passwordlessly connect to one of these lab machines from your local machine. It's just a convenience thing. You can also make it use a password again. But it's a neat little make things easier aspect of your life. OK, so moving on from automation. You're going to run into some bad news at some point during the course of a, of a project. If that never happens to you, then you're probably some kind of unicorn, because that never happens to me. No. All right, Robert? So what to do when things go bad? First and foremost, talk to your professors. For the most part, they are not evil people, and they genuinely want you to succeed. For the most part. So. We recommend that you make use of them as a resource. Most professors have office hours posted, and they like to hear from students that have problems. So go to your office hours. Go early. Practically everyone goes the night before. 
if you go the night before, you may or may not be able to actually have time to get all of your questions answered. And usually professors are willing to work with you if they know that you're having a lot of problems. So the important thing is go early, but more importantly, just go. Now we're going to talk a little bit about debugging. Because professors are not a magic bullet, unfortunately. Yeah, and sometimes they want you to work on it a little bit yourself first. Sometimes. I don't know why they would. So if we do our make, we'll see that we currently have in our directory a thing called fizzbuzz. So there's a tool called GDB, which allows you to inspect the state of a program. Now at this point, we don't really have that much in our fizzbuzz program. So let's edit our fizzbuzz program. And start to write some code for it. Is it going to be good code? Well, we hope so. So we know that we're going to be reading in some integer i. And we know that we're going to want to get that out of argv. So let's do a s scan f on argv1. And we're going to look for a integer field. And we're going to put that into the variable i and store that result. Because we're using argc, we need to do a pound include of stdio.h, which is the header library that includes sscanf. Now you may have noticed that Robert has some magic over here. If you'd like to become powerful at editing, look into Vim. It can do stuff like this. OK. So now at this point, we need to print out our fizz and buzz. So if the variable i is divisible by 2, then we want to do what? Well, we want to print fizz. Now, notice that I did not add a new line at this point. You generally want to terminate an entire line of output with a new line character, but at this point, we're not going to do that. So next thing we could do is then add our line for if it's divisible by 3. Okay, And then lastly, let's add that new line. Okay, So now we have a simple program that should allow us to parse that input. So at this point, let's run our tests. Okay. backwards. Okay, so now we see that a lot more of our tests have passed. The only two that we haven't passed so far are our invalid test cases. So what we'd want to do at this point is do another commit. Get add make file, get add fizzbuzz.c, and then do our git commit. So now that we've got that passing, we can do another make hand in. And you'll see that it's made a new archive. Well, with something like this, it's very easy to submit early and submit often, which can help you in some cases. For example, if you're working on a project and you have been submitting everything up to, a, up to a certain point, and it turns out that something was working earlier and now it's broken, and it's too late to update anything, the fact that it has been submitted at some point may give you some leniency with your professor. So, 
Sometimes they'll allow you to grade your latest submission that happened prior to the deadline. So now that we've done that, let's talk about GDB. So GDB is a useful tool. So we've made our program. So now let's try debugging it. So GDB. Uh, what, are, what exactly are we trying to debug? Not well, one thing that's not working is what happens when we pass, say, the word fizzbuzz instead of an actual number. So let's take a look and see if we can figure that out. So we say, use the GNU debugger on the program fizzbuzz. Notice that we compi when we compiled this, we compiled it with the dash G flag. That adds the debugging symbols. That's going to make this process a lot easier. So you'll see a bunch of different information. So what you want to do is you want to break it main. So breaking it main says, when you're executing this program, whenever you get to the definition of main, whenever you enter the function main, stop and let, ask me what you want to do next. So we'll break it main, and then we're going to run the program with the input fizz buzz, like so. So let's see what happens. Oop. That's because of Apple stuff. Um, bulk of that wouldn't normally appear. So. Let's print the value of i at this line. So we see right now that i currently has a value of 0. But we haven't necessarily explicitly set i. Depending on where exactly we are on the heap, i could have any number of values. So if then we go to the next line, it'll say that we're doing i divided i mod 3 equal equal 0. OK, that looks fine. We see that we step inside of the program, or step inside the if condition, and we print fizz. Then we see that we enter the next conditional, and we print buzz, or we would print buzz. And we see that we output the content fizzbuzz. But is fizzbuzz divisible by two and three? Sure. Well, not really. So. Now we need to write some additional code in order to fix that. But if you can. You haven't noticed what GDB lets you do is interact with your code live. Isn't that great? Yeah. So if you have a more complicated program in something segfaults, like let's just add a segfault real quick. Normally you don't want to do this to your code. Don't add segfaults. Okay. So, uh, Include segfault ID. <laughs> nice try. I was just going to try this instead, though. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> no, I, I think that, like, by definition, it's not. Okay, so. Why don't you free main? Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Will that work, Brendan? I, I think it might. Okay. <laughs> okay, it compiles. Something was definitely not OK. Now let's run GDB and figure out if we can figure out what's going on. So let's run this with fizzbuzz. So running fizzbuzz with the, out, with the input fizzbuzz. You just run it with a greater number to find the segfault. Yeah. So we see that we see received an abort. Malik didn't want to do something. Well, where the heck are we? Good question. Let's ask. Where are we? And we see that we're currently in free in main. And we see that we're at line 12, so we can print fizzbuzz. How do we know we're at line 12? Uh, very end of the line. Is this quote 12 number, or colon 12 number, that how, that's how we know what line we're at. Using a colon and then a number is kind of a common indicator that you're at that line. Oop. Um, I'm trying to remember what the command is. It's list. That's it. So if we say list fizzbuzz.c colon 12, it'll list some context around the location 12. So we can see, oh, on that line, we tried to free main. That's obviously a bad thing. We should probably go and fix that. Um, so if you have your program and it's segfaulting all over the place and you have no idea why, this can be a useful step. Now, what we can also do at this point is we can break at line 11. So break. 
and defaults to whatever the current C file is. So if you only have one C file, it'll break at line 11. <coughs> so we put a break at line 11. It'll tell us what file to put the breakpoint in, just so we can confirm our sanity. Let's remove the make file or remove the break from main. So we've cleared main. Never had one because we we started. That's right. So then we can run it again. All right, from the beginning. Yes. So we click next. And then we see that we're about to run this. Let's print the value of main. It's obviously not on the heap. There's our problem. So if we see that we're like dividing by zero or something like that, we can figure out why that might be happening as a result of what the values of these given variables are. You can use the print thing to print structures, classes. It's actually pretty intelligent. So it's a really powerful tool to have in your toolbox. Now, sometimes you'll segfault in the middle of some random library that you have no entire idea where you're at. At that point, when you do your where, you can actually do what's called an up, which will take you upwards in the call string. If we do a continue at this point, we see where. We see we're in pthread kill. We can go up. What's a pthread, right? Yeah. No idea where that is. But we can go up until we find out and get to the context where that current program is. And as I said, we can print any value at this point. You can actually even set a value. Um, using the set command. I think it's set var i equals 4. But it's been a while since I've done that. So now if we print i, we'll see that i now has the value of 3 regardless of what it had previously. We can then also set it to, say, 14. And we can actually modify the memory of the program as it's running. So if you're particularly masochistic, you can actually script GDB and get it to run a bunch of automated tests that test only a given function by arbitrarily setting the values that go into it. So, but if you need that level of precision, it does exist. So GDB is a very valuable tool. Definitely recommend you learn it. Any questions about GDB? You can also just throw this thing in developer and see what happens. It can help with sick pulse too sometimes. A machine. So. As if by magic. Now these do have Valgrind, don't they? They do. All right, all the lab machines have Valgrind now. We're going to write another easy to break thing. Like maybe it'll have a seg follows first and then perhaps something like a few memory leaks, right? Something like that. STL lib. I think there's a D in there. Yes, there is. Thank you. All right, is, is there anyone who doesn't know what a memory leak is? Don't be shy. All right, so for anyone who doesn't know what a memory leak is, uh, when you're, normally when you're creating um, local variables and stuff, C will handle managing that memory for you. But there are cases where you want to handle creating and managing your own chunks of memory to deal with stuff. That's when you have to work with pointers mostly. When then, at that point, you may forget to release that memory that you have asked for. And that can sometimes happen a lot, very often, if you're working in a loop or something. When you, when you ask for memory from the computer and then you don't get it back, that is referred to as a memory leak. And they're not very good, because if you have a big memory leak, it will eventually make you run out of space. Also, this is why you should compile with warnings. So as you see, we got a compiler warning from the compiler that told us that we're trying to free a thing that's not on the heap, but it let it finish anyway. So this is why you should look at your warnings. Also use Clang, or we're using GCC. So try Clang, see what happens. There we go. There. Look how pretty that warning is. It's so nice. This power can be yours. Just install Clang. So at this point, dot slash a dot out. And we're going to run that through Val, Val, Valgrind. I think it's mim check full. Just do normal at first. It'll, it'll give you the other parameters. All right, you get a bunch of stuff. But the important line is right there where it says leak summary. You see it says definitely lost 10,000 bytes. <coughs> that would be the um, 
problem that we had where we accidentally created that large integer pointer and then never did anything with it, nor freed it. For counts of detected and suppressed errors from, oh, that's just me. I thought it gave you the mem check full one. Yeah, it does. So you can do dash dash mem hyphen check equal full. And it'll give you exactly what line it thinks it lost given memory. And, it, and then it'll tell you where you had the invalid free. Oh, on. Yeah. Scroll up so we can see that. There we go. Yeah. So we can see the invalid free that we had. And we can also see where exactly the particular problems happened. So, Valgrind, another very useful tool for debugging weird stuff that's happening with your program. So let's fix our problem with memory. And then let's fix those other problems. So if, so how many of you know that scanf returns a return value? I knew that, yeah. Well, it actually returns a return value. And the return value it returns is the number of things that it successfully parsed. So if it does not parse exactly one thing, then we know that we had a problem. So we can return one in that case. Um, do a right quit. And now if we do our make test again, we'll see that we got all of them except for when we don't have any arguments. So then we can edit our fizzbuzz one more time. Just one more test. And we can say if arg c does not equal to return one. So what this says is if we don't have two things coming in from the command line, fail out and return one. Why did I say does not equal two? Why do you think I didn't just say um, equals zero. one or not zero? Any thoughts? Why don't you give it to him, Robert? Okay. So argc has returns the number of arguments passed on the command line, including the command itself. So in this case, fizzbuzz would be our first argument, so argc would be one. And then if we have a second command, then argc would be two. The other thing that we want to point out here is if we had three values, that would likewise be invalid. We wouldn't want to parse that. So at this point, we should pass all of our tests. Yeah. So. Can I get 100 in this one? Again, it's easy. And now our final project has been submitted to hand it. <clears throat> All right, just a couple more stuff about, a couple more things about reverting old changes. You might run into this every once in a while where <coughs> you decide that a certain thing you did a while ago was actually a terrible idea, or you might want to do a bunch of different things in a different, bunch of different ways. Version control makes all this pretty easy. If you smartly commit and branch properly before you do major things or after you complete like a nice tidy chunk of code, you can easily either revert that or go back to it and start a new, do a different thing with version control. The, basically the lesson of that slide is version control, control is nice. Okay, a couple of final pointers on how to finish a project smart. Because you've been being pretty smart throughout the whole thing so far. Keep it smart throughout the rest of the submission process. Robert? So, in short, test everything again before you submit. As you saw, we demonstrated, we ran all our tests, we made sure everything worked, and then we did our commit. Also, whatever a sum bit is, do that too. Yeah. So, we'll fix that typo after this presentation. Um, hand in lets you submit as many times as you want. So, it makes it easy to provide multiple submissions yeah. and make sure There's things are really done. No harm in submitting absolutely everything. Now one last very important thing. 
if you decide to say track your code on GitHub or Bitbucket instead of on the Buffet servers, where it is private by default, um, make sure that you do not make your code public unless your professor explicitly allows you to do so. Um, if you make your code public, it can sometimes be considered part of academic dishonesty and they can take steps against you. So the short answer is just don't do it. It's better for everyone if you be don't. <laughs> so. All right, a couple of final further resources. As always, the Unix man pages are an incredibly versatile and useful tool. If you have Valgrind installed, you type make Valgrind and it tells you all you need to know about Valgrind and how to run it. Let's see that. And GCC. Oh, that's a lot of text. You don't have to read the whole thing, just so you know. But in case you ever want to reference anything, the man pages are excellent. The grimoire is a collection of scripting-related resources, all written by the same guy. It's very, very useful for learning things like awk, sed, and what else? Born shell. Born shell, yeah, bash stuff. Further, there's also the Arch Linux wiki, which has a reference for just about everything on Linux. Um, it's yet another excellent thing to go take a look at if you're bored and want to learn more about how to be cool and automate stuff. And finally, we have a link in here for anyone who looks at this presentation to, again, my Magic Bank file, the GitHub repository for automatically sub submitting stuff to hand in, testing stuff in the lab machines, and making your life a little bit easier. If, to get emails on this stuff, um, you'll want to sign up for our mailing list. If you're not already on that, come and talk to us and we'll get you on there. Now, a couple more quick things that you might want to look into. These are all useful commands that we don't really have time to fully talk about, but take a look at them yourself. Time is a great one if you want to figure out how long something takes. You just say time program, it'll tell you how long that program took to run. Watch is an awesome command that will rerun a program every couple seconds. So if you want to do something over and over again, like watch to see if your program is crashing with certain inputs or something, just type watch. Or if you want to automatically recompile something as you're uh, building it. SCP and SSH are great for moving between machines, moving files between machines, doing stuff on the lab machines, for example. Find and sed are more complex, uh, deep sort of Unix tools. Find is for looking for files, for it, but it's very versatile. For example, if you have a uh, file somewhere in your computer that was made a month ago and has exactly 36 lines in it, you can probably find it with find, no matter where it is. Sed is a tool for manipulating text input via the command line. So it can, for example, take a text file and replace every instance of the word cats with the word kittens. Very cool stuff, but again, a little bit hard to fully explain in just a few minutes. Uh, a couple of these things are mentioned on that grimoire page, and you can read more about them on the glorious thing known as the internet. I think it's a series of tubes or something. Anyway, that about wraps up the presentation on learning how to get smart about your projects. Does anyone have any questions before we let you go? Just so, just to double check, the Magic Make files can be sent to us on the, via email. Yes, okay. we'll include we'll a link to it. To all this stuff. If you're already on our mailing list, if not, come and talk to us to get on it. Yes. So the will the PowerPoint be in the email as well? What's a PowerPoint? Our yes, the presentation, presentation will be uh, linked to, via an email. This is actually hosted on a website. Okay. We don't have to do PowerPoint, thankfully. Um, so you can, we actually have this stuff hosted on the repository at uh, GitHub. So it's very easy to deploy if you want to mirror it locally yourself for some reason. But yes, we will send out a link to this presentation. Yes, Daniel. Does password plus SSH and allow machines work off campus? Um, yes, it does. Yes. You still have to go through access, but you can do it without any passwords. All right, any more questions? Comments, concerns, limericks, haikus, puns. Thank you, Robert. All right, that's it for us. Thank you for being here, everyone.